Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine war news. No, it's not. It's a Ukraine war update extra video. <laughs> Brain. Uh, giving you the extra nuggets and tidbits to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. It feels like there's a war in my head, let alone Ukraine. Anyway, let's get to where we are going to start, which is another Chris O'Wiki thread concerning mobilized Russians, this time uh, from the Kanti Mansi Autonomous Okrug in Western Siberia, who have reportedly, be, reportedly been detained in an unknown location and told they will be shot unless they sign a contract with a mercenary company. The regional news outlet Maxun reports that men from the region were sent to the occupied Luhansk region of Ukraine in December 2022 after initial training in Russia. They were assigned to guard duties at a factory until the 3rd of April and then relatives lost contact with them. On the 18th of April, one of the men got in touch to say they had been divided into two groups. All their phones and identity documents had been taken away, and the men had been sent to the front line. They had been replaced by prisoners who had been given their previous guard duties. The men say they were threatened with being shot in the knees or killed if they did not sign a contract with the veterans, uh, inverted commons, veterans private military company, this threat may have been acted upon in at least one case. One of the men called his wife to say he was being held in a hospital in Luhansk. She travelled there but was not allowed to see him and could not call him back as he appeared to be using phones borrowed from other patients. The man, Dmitry Ogorodny, told her he would be discharged and taken somewhere else. He had no idea where he would be taken or how he would be equipped as he had been stripped of all his documents. The men's... I mean, imagine that, that in that situation, you are kind of... Literally, your identity's been stolen off of you. You are whoever these other people say you are. And you are doing... I mean, this is... This is slavery of, of the worst... Of one of the worst kinds, right? You are being enslaved to the Russian military machine, being made to fight a war that you don't necessarily agree with. And you are, it looks like you're even being valued less than the convicts being sent to the front line here. Incredible. The men's wives have written appeals to all levels of the Russian political and military bureaucracies, but have either not received replies or have not or have only been given denials. The regional ombudsman Natalia Strebo Strebkova has unhelpfully suggested the whole matter is a hoax. She says that several relatives have made appeals to her office, but she has not been able to contact Ogorodny himself. She finds the similarity of the relatives' accounts suspicious. Quote, it's like a template, like a piece of paper. From my experience, I admit that this is a fake. We have several appeals. They're all like a blueprint. The same phrases in each one. Uh, Strebkova also thinks it's implausible that Wagner would be forcibly conscripting members of the Russian army. You understand, she says, a journalist, uh, that it c cannot be a priori that their documents are taken away from them uh, and that they force them to go to Wagner. However, there were very similar reports early in April of Mobix from Yakutia uh, and Western Russia being held at gunpoint by Wagner men and told to sign contracts with the veterans and Wolves PMCs. So this has happened before. We've got presents for it. Uh, and the denials, I don't know. Are, are they particularly strong? Uh, it, it, it looks like things are not going well within uh, the, the realms of mobilization in Russia. Now, we have a counteroffensive on its way. CNN has just reported that Ukraine, as it prepares for its counteroffensive, uh, leave Russia in disarray. So let's uh, dip into this. Zaporizhia in Ukraine. So Ukraine's much anticipated counteroffensive appears imminent and the way each side is preparing speaks volumes about their readiness. Kyiv's front lines are abuzz with vehicle movement and artillery strikes with regular explosions hitting vital Russian targets in occupied areas. Its defense minister has said preparations are, quote, coming to an end and President Zelensky has assured the counteroffensive will happen while demurring on the exact start date. It may have already started. It may be weeks away. We don't know. And that fact uh, is a strong measure of Ukraine's success as this begins. Moscow, on the other hand, is in the closing time bar brawl stage of their war. After losing Kharkiv and 
Kherson, they have had at least seven months to ready the next likely target of Ukraine, uh, of Ukrainian attack, sorry, Zaporizhia. That has happened. With vast trench defence networks that can be seen from space, that recognition of the their enormity is not necessarily a compliment in 2023. They are big, yes, but they are also something anyone can uh, peruse on Google. That's not great in an era of precise rockets and speedy armoured advances. But it's the last 72 hours that have perhaps most portrayed Russia's lacking readiness. First, the apparent firing of the Deputy Defence Minister in charge of logistics. The Russian Ministry of Defence has not spelled out his dismissal, merely issuing a decree that Kuzmenkov now has his job. The butcher of Mariupol, as Mizintsev is known, surely had enough failings over Russia's disastrous war to merit his firing, but... This fails to satisfy the question, why now? By removing key ministers in the moments before its army faces Ukraine's counter assault, Moscow sends a mess message of disarray. This is a really important point. And I was talking only about with all these movements with Russian commanders, which hypothesis does is better support? The one where Russia's doing really well and Ukraine are losing, and the one where Russia's up a creek without a paddle in terms of you know, how well their war has gone. And it's the latter that this definitely supports. Why would you get rid of key uh, personnel just before a counteroffensive, just before the storm hits? You're like, yeah, you're sacked. You're moving on. Just, yeah, it's, n it's not a good look. Uh, and then there's Yevgeny Prigozhin's new round of criticism. The Wagner mercenary warlord chose Sunday to give another long interview in which he laid bare the sheer extent of the issues his mercenaries face. According to the Wagner head, his fighters are so low on ammunition that they have had to withdraw from Bakhmut, the strategically unimportant city they have squandered thousands of lives trying to take. A caveat, Prigozhin is not the most trustworthy source and provides little evidence for what he says. But this sort of public spat isn't something Moscow would encourage at the sensitive moment. So indeed, if... If what he's saying is kind of psyops or it's him trying to leverage uh, more support from the MOD, it's still not great. It's still not a great look, this, for the Russians. It still doesn't indicate that everything's going well for them. Russia's eroding ammunition supplies were long known, but to suggest imminent failure just ahead of the counteroffensive smacks of a major bid to shift blame. The bottom line is the hours before Ukraine moves are shrinking. The amount we know about their emotional state or target is almost zero, and the extent of Moscow's internal indecision, rivalries, and disunity only grows. That is a claim here from, from CNN that Russia are just not in a particularly good uh, position to deal adequately with the coming counteroffensive. And I've told you before how soon from high to low, uh, I flip from positive to really op really optimistic to really cautious about this coming counteroffensive. But the more I think about it, and as long as you don't have big hits like Pavel Khorad last night, where you, you probably got quite a lot of munitions being taken out by the Russians, as long as you don't have a lot of that, Ukraine are in a, in a really good position, I think, to to have an effective counteroffensive. Uh, if they if they punch through uh, one single weakness or a couple of weaknesses in, in the front line of the Russians, you can just imagine a, a, an overwhelmingly effective uh, attack counteroffensive given the, the sheer number of trained troops they're bringing to bear here and the number of or the amount of uh, mechanized equipment and other military hardware. It could be something to get excited about as a pro-Ukrainian. But again, then the pessimist in me goes, yeah, but this could go wrong. That could go wrong. This could go wrong. I'd like to be really positive about it. So going on to something else here, we've got Dmitry War translated, translating a video of uh, an ex-convict here. Survive if you can. Russian ex-convict Yakov Lev tells how the MOD recruited 110 convicts from St. Petersburg prison and threw them to the front lines without supplies or provisions. According to him, on the February the 21st, they were brought back to Donetsk region. They were not given any documents, were placed in the basement and left without professional soldiers. Of the promised salary, only 40,000 rubles were paid. Yakov Lev notes that the six-month contract had no conditions except to survive if they can. God, imagine that being your, your contract. We're going to kind of sign a contract. Hey, you can go free after six months. Uh, what you have to do is just survive. I mean, we can do anything to you, but as long as you survive, you'll go free in six months. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there's an awful lot of wriggle room for Wagner to do what the hell they like. Right, I am, as I, I told you before, I'm going to read out these subtitles. A lot of you listen whilst doing other things. Uh, so that's how, it's go how I'm going to roll here. 
She says, hello, today is April the 7th, 2023. We, we are located in, I'll say more precisely, Vodjanie village, Yazinovatsky district. Um, uh, it's Here's a membership card, so you wouldn't be thinking that we're the Ukrainian, in Ukrainian captivity or something. Our situation is very difficult. My name is Yakovlev Yuri uh, Valerievich. Uh, I was born in St. Petersburg, Leningrad on 3rd of May, 1987. From 2015, I was sentenced in the, the maximum security colony in St. Petersburg in FK, FKU IK4 the, until 20th of February, 2023. On 20th of February, people from the Ministry of Defence took us as volunteers to the Special Military Operations Zone. We had no documents. When we arrived, we had a company of around 110 people. Their com the commander was chosen among us. Uh, that is ex-convicts. There was no leadership. I cannot say any names. We had a kind of a battalion commander, Major Styra. Uh, at first, the whole company of 110 people was living in a basement. No documents were given to us. Only 40,000 rubles were paid. The contract was signed for six months from 20th of February until the 20th of August. No conditions were added to the contract. Just survive. And that's it. Uh, so we arrived here on the 21st of February. The company commander was chosen, etc. Our group of 22 people was separated into an assault group, the so-called Storm Z. Storm Z. Storm Z. He's a um, UK grime musician. Uh, again, no leadership. Some man, Misha, arrived. Uh, who was a telegram Misha in Donbass. Uh, he gave us weapons and said we'll be assaulting. As I understood, he is not military. Just a volunteer from Moscow who is unable to fight. Due to his faults, our lad died. Our lads died. I can say who, uh, and he names four ex-convicts. There is also one who lost his leg on a mine. And there is just another. Yes, it's anecdotal, but is it reflective? Does it, is this an indication of actually how things are generally across large areas of the front line? Yes, or when it when convicts are concerned, I think it does. There's just too much of this kind of. Uh, these kinds of declarations that are being made that we're seeing there's no reason to think they're not bona fide here he gives all the reasons right at the beginning of the video to say look i'm not in the ukrainian captivity i'm not being put up to this this is who i am this is where i was captured and these are the issues i have and yeah it's just uh, what a terrible state of affairs okay moving on to what i think is a really significant bit of news this is in the times and well as you know uh, there's BRICS. BRICS is this political agreement between Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. South Africa is one of the small, smaller players you know, can, can compared to Russia and China, for example. Uh, but it is hosting, I think, a BRICS meeting. But at the same time, they're also signed up to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and there's an arrest warrant out for Putin. So South Africa have been umming and ahhing about what should happen should Putin come to South Africa. Will he get arrested or not? And previously, someone on the ICC, uh, you know, with an ICC arrest warrant has not been arrested in South Africa. I think some uh, Islamic terrorist or, or something, some someone previously ha had not been. And so there was a lot of... A lot of thought from analysts that South Africa would basically side with Russia and not arrest Putin, or at least not say that they would arrest him. Anyway, this is fascinating. Stay away or we'll have to arrest you, South Africa tells Putin. President Putin will be asked by South Africa to attend a key summit via Zoom and not in person after Pretoria sought legal advice about its obligations to arrest the Russian leader who has been indicted for war crimes by the International Criminal Court. Putin was invited to attend a gathering of the heads of the five-strong bloc of emerging economies made up of Brazil, Russia, India, China and the host South Africa. South Africa has refused to support sanctions against Russia or condemn its aggression in Ukraine. I mean, that's massively controversial, right? However, the recent issuing of an arrest warrant for Putin by the ICC, which has accused him of forcibly deporting Ukrainian children from Russian-occupied territory, has left South Africa's governing party in an awkward position over the meeting in Johannesburg. President Ramaphosa announced last week that the his African National Congress wanted to end the country's membership of the ICC, a statement he quickly backtracked on, but which reflected his government's dilemma. So how do we get out of this? Let's just sign out of a real strong moral um, framework that, that means that war, war criminals will be held accountable. Uh, I'd rather just step out of that so war criminals can do what they like just so we can welcome in good old poots, uh, so on and so forth. Private legal advice obtained by the foreign ministry has warned that ignoring the warrant would breach South Africa's international obligations and would be in breach of the country's own laws. So not just international laws, their own laws. South Africa's failure to arrest Omar al-Bashir, this was it, the, 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 then the leader of Sudan, sorry it wasn't, um, 
it was a Sudanese leader, uh, during a visit in 2016, was later ruled unconstitutional by the country's senior judges. So there is internal legal uh, precedence for South Africa having to adhere to the, the this ruling. Uh, there's no option to not to arrest Putin. If he comes here, we have to arrest him. A senior government official who had sight of the legal advice told South Africa's Sunday Times, the only option we have is for him to connect via Teams or Zoom from Moscow. Ramaphosa has sent a delegation to Washington to explain in person, person the country's refusal to condemn Russia's aggression, which has led to calls for South Africa to be excluded from preferential trade arrangements with African states. South Africa recently played host to Moscow's foreign minister and warships from Russia and China for joint naval exercises so there is this uh pressure i think this is where america have been very good and the eu and others but many america in putting pressure on these other nations to tow the party line or at least to, to not be so uh, pro-russia i think egypt changed their tune in, in terms of what they were making uh, we've had turkey uh, become stronger in their in their opposition to Russia, we've had Hungary and Orban even reverse, and Serbia reversing some of their sort of declarations or positions that they had adopted before that were preferential towards Russia under pressure from the US and the EU. And I think that's so important. They're doing such a good job in saying, yeah, OK, if, if you want to be this kind of supporter of Russia, that, that, that's fine. You, you do that, South Africa. You do that. If you want to do that, it's fine. It's just that we won't do this and we won't do that and you won't get this. And then South Africa, uh, oh, okay, right. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see, you know, how South Africa is used as a bit of a political football there as to, as to what what will happen going forward. Uh, but that's really good news that, that from a legal point of view, they, they have to be seen to arrest him and that if they have communicated that to Putin, then that is a step in the right direction. For sure. Right. I did yesterday a thread on successes and failures from Mick Ryan, a retired Australian general. I'm going to go on to the successes here. He said he would do a, a follow up thread and this is it. Right. Undoubtedly, each hour the time set for the planned attack for the forthcoming Ukrainian offensives is drawing near. For months, Ukrainian planners and strategic leaders preparing uh, have been preparing an how might we assess the success of the offensives to come? In my previous post on this topic, I described the rationale for measures of success and failure. I also listed five principles for their development and application. Success in the coming offensives can be measured at different levels and over different timescales. Progress will be assessed by multitudes of analysts, journalists, politicians and citizens. At the same time, some will quickly jump on short-term tactical setbacks instead of waiting a few days to assess the full implications of such incidents. We had to be really careful of that. I mean, me, you, everyone in this kind of information space, that, that things will not go swimmingly for the Ukrainians 100% of the time. Uh, will they go swimmingly more than 50% of the time? We will see whether this is going to be a success or a failure. But initial setbacks m might be what is expected as opposed to an indication of the, the potential overall success of uh, any counter offensive so just you know it's about managing expectations for sure uh, i propose a set of measures of success for the forthcoming offensives some of the measures are tactical some are more strategic or political together they are a linked set of measures that can be used to assess whether the degree to which ukrainian offensives are successful now it's always really important to Success can only be measured when you know the objectives. And from people like us, and even uh, Mick Ryan here, he won't know the objectives. He won't know the true objectives. You can tr try and read between the lines, see what the Ukrainians do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you know exactly what's going on with their planning. So it's very difficult to measure success if you don't know what the goal is. Um, anyway. Um, in this thread, I have only covered measures of success. The full uh, set of measures of success and failure are in my latest Futura Doctrina post, uh, Doctrina post uh, on his Substack, so you can go and check that out. Measure one, Ukraine achieves surprise tactical and operational levels, some political impact short term. Generating surprise leads to shock. Shock should lead to slower Russian decision making and responses to Ukrainian operations. While relatively easy to assess on the ground, limitations on sharing information with news organisations may make this harder to assess in the short term. It is, however, a key component for 
the success of the Ukrainian offensives. This is really important, and there's been lots of talk. Ukraine have been talking themselves about how deception is going to play a part. That's been mentioned and surprise. So I imagine there will be some things that happen that will be surprising, and that that's really important in war. It can it can lead to advantages here and there. I mean, there's still talk about something taking place perhaps in the Bakhmut area. Uh, some element of surprise there before. May the 9th to perhaps stop Russia from taking that that kind of political win, that PR win that they're expecting and hoping for before May, May the 9th. Measure two, Ukraine is able to destroy or degrade Russian tactical and operational reserves, command and control and logistics before the offensive uh, tactical operation on strategic impact short term. The Ukrainians will want to limit the Russians' ability to respond to their attacks finding and neutralizing mobile Russian reserves, headquarters and logistics before and at the beginning of the offensives will be important. Achieving this is reliant on excellent intelligence, various long-range strike mechanisms, as well as air, missile and drone defenses. Now, the US, NATO have been training. Like, I can't tell you the importance of what is just about to happen. Since the inception of NATO, this is probably the culmination. I don't mean that in that, that kind of military sense. This is the culmination of all the training, all the things that NATO have put in place in terms of combined arms maneuvers, in terms of getting equipment, in terms of countering Russians, Russia's armed forces. This, this is it. You can be assured that the top brass of NATO are putting in every bit of, getting, gathering every bit of in top quality intelligence they can, from satellites to human intelligence or open source into everything will be uh, compiled, assimilated, poured over, analysed, evaluated, and thrown into uh, helping to, to plan this counteroffensive with the Ukrainian forces. NATO and the US have, this is what, this is what NATO, this is his raison d'etre, right? This counteroffensive. They there will be so much effort being put into this by NATO and US forces and, and allies that uh, everything short of like loads of the hardware that you would like, like F-16s and all that kind of stuff. But it but in terms of outside of the actual bits of hardware how you put together this counteroffensive you can bet that nato has done everything it can it can to assist ukraine in obtaining success measure 3 ukraine takes back its territory tactical and operational but with political ramifications this might seem obvious but this needs to be an explicit measure of success i don't propose a certain percentage of territory that should be recaptured but if most of luhansk kherson and zaporizhia are recaptured this would be a very successful outcome and it would be a good foundation for subsequent operations against Crimea and Donetsk in the future. I, I just, I've lost sight of Luhansk. As a bit. I previously have, have argued how Luhansk is super important, as in Starobilsk is super important as a logistical hub. You take that out and they've got to go all around the side to, to provide logistics and supplies to their front line. But I've really come round to thinking it's all about it's all about Zaporizhia, all about Zaporizhia, and then actually coming through somehow across the Dnipro after Zaporizhia has been sort of um, after there's been a real punch into Zaporizhia. Will there be a secondary attack somewhere else? Or, or yeah, probably. But I I see Luhansk as far less important than all of this so my minimum if if i was oh goodness me don't put me in charge of anything but it, my opinion is that your your bare minimum is this area of red down here that is your counter offensive success if you gain success there then that allows you to get crimea and it's not too too difficult then as a, as a moving on after you've obtained success there to take Crimea. And really, Luhansk has secondary importance to all of that. Yes, you've got places like Rubizhny, Sverodunetsk, Lysychansk that are important sort of 
uh, uh, conurbation um, and you've got this whole much more densely populated area north of Horlivka and you've got the 2014 annexed regions but this area here of Luhansk is very limited in its uh, value in terms of the kind of physical geography that's there, the lack of huge settlements. You've just got that one line down there. So I've said before, really what you can do is you can maybe do a small sort of counter offensive to take back Svatova and then get close enough that you can just hammer uh, Starobilsk so that it, it's, it's not useful at all. I mean, you already can pretty much hammer that anyway without even moving further to the east. Uh, it gets hit there or thereabouts by high miles and another aerial activity. I have changed my opinion on how there will be a counteroffensive in the north. There may well be, it could be multiple, um, but I just think there's going to be an awful lot of focus on the Zaporizhia region. Right, anyway, sorry, I digressed uh, as I have a tendency to do. Measure four, Ukraine is postured to retake Crimea at the end of the offensives, and this is what I was saying just then, operational, strategic, and political medium term. As I've written previously, the last campaign of the war may be the campaign Ukraine conducts to take back Crimea. I've argued more recently that I think Crimea will be taken before the Donbass will be taken. This is the most important aspect. This is what Russia want the most. Russia want Crimea because they need a warm water deep sea port that they can park their uh, Black Sea fleet in and have access to the rest of the world. We'll come back to here and we'll look at what Mick Ryan says. Therefore, the coming offences will be successful if the Ukrainian armed forces are well placed for follow on operations to take back Crimea, either through making it untenable uh, for the Russians to stay or an actual military operation to seize it. That is exactly what I've been talking about. You don't necessarily have to send troops in. You can just make it untenable that the Ukrainians, uh, that the Russians, uh, untenable for the Russians so that they basically get out of there. Let's go and have a look at this then in the rest of the world. I've told you before that the only reason Russia are interested in Syria, the only reason Russia are there is because it op offers them a, a port. It offers them a port that they can access the Mediterranean from or several ports. And as a result, they can have ships that can operate in the Mediterranean from Syria. They don't care about Syria. Syria isn't doesn't have any other value to them, I think, other than those ports. That is why Russia are in Syria. Likewise, Ukraine really offers importance to and offers value to Russia because of Sevastopol being a warm water deep sea port. So deep sea means that it can moor in the port, within the port environment, ships, submarines and all sorts. Whereas they've had to take their submarines and a lot of their ships out of Sevastopol because of drone uh, attacks, and they've moved them to Novorossiysk, uh, which is not a deep water port. And in fact, it's also a commercial port. So lots of their naval vessels are having to moor outside the port area. That is not ideal. So that is why they've always wanted Sevastopol. It's just a much better port. And from there, it's also central to the Black Sea. I know it doesn't sound like it's massively important, but historically that has been important for control of this entire area. Sevastopol is super important. And that allows them to have this reach that goes from the Black Sea into uh, the Mediterranean. And then from the Mediterranean out into the Atlantic, uh, north and south. Yes, Syria does give them some capability, but if they can't access Syria by land, you know, then then it's not so easy. They can't get their cruise missiles to Syria and loaded onto those ships and so on and so forth. But if they have got land access to Sevastopol, then that is that is really important. So that Sevastopol becomes a super important port. Now, if Sevastopol goes and, you know, perhaps Syria, if you take that out, then they are left with uh, ports that are not warm water ports, which means for part of the year they freeze over. And that is St. Petersburg up here. 
uh, which is problematic because now Finland is part of NATO. You've got Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, these Baltics, and you've got Sweden, and you've got Norway and, and, and Denmark, and all of these countries are like, yeah, we don't really like you sailing all your, your boats and uh, all your ships and um, submarines around here, so we're going to stop that from happening or make it more difficult for you, which then means they have to go to ports right up here in the north, in the kind of Arctic regions, or you have to go to Vladivostok, I think it is, over here on the eastern coast of, of Russia, right over near Japan, and that is not uh, ideal for them either. You can see how important it is for their kind of global strategy that they have Crimea and that they have, therefore, Sevastopol. So if you're talking about what Ukraine want to do, for me, the, the whole of Ukraine is really about Crimea. Not entirely, but, but mainly. So therefore, anything that Ukraine do will be about getting Crimea. So that's why this area will be super important. That'll be their initial short-term gain, short-term objective. And then the medium term objective will be Crimea, and and I think the Donbass will be will be left to maybe argue about uh, once they've taken Crimea and Luhansk. You can maybe see that getting taken back in sort of smaller offensives. Just go back to the global situation. You can see like there the importance of that single port for this whole area of the world, right? Is is huge. It's absolutely huge. Don't underestimate it. Right, measure five. Ukraine captures uh, or destroys Russian forces, tactical and operational, but with political and strategic ramifications related to the recapture of its territories, the capture or destruction of Russian forces. The Russians have to be beaten and seen to be beat. A successful Ukrainian offensive will also ensure sufficient U Russian combat power is destroyed to prevent Russia conducting any follow-on offensives for the remainder of 2023. Measure 6, Ukraine preserves sufficient forces to continue defending some areas or, and conduct subsequent offensives in others, operational and strategic medium term, and Ukrainians will invest a significant part of their combat power on in this offensive. This is to say that they might well have objectives to take out Russian forces. Uh, it's not just about taking territory, but if they take the forces, those forces cannot then exact you know, a cost on the Ukrainian forces in going forward, but it also means they can't defend. Not only can they not go on the offensive in the future, but they can't also adequately defend some of these places in future operations. So that's really important. You may say that the territory is, is of primary importance and then attriting Russian forces of secondary importance. Um, when we were looking at why Kherson wasn't as successful as it could have been, it appeared that the, the Ukrainians were reticent to properly harass the Russians as they successfully, as it turned out, operationally withdrew. And one of the reasons might be because this was their success criteria. So it, the success criteria was not just about taking out Russian forces, but protecting their own. So measure six, Ukraine preserves sufficient forces to continue defending some areas and conduct subsequent offensives. Uh, and I remember someone pointing this out, saying that actually, when you understand that in this situation, that was one of their number one goals, preserve their own forces. That is why they didn't hassle the Russians and allow the Russians effectively to escape fairly much, you know, unhurt to some degree. They did lose quite a lot of equipment, um, but that was really over the whole period of, of the fighting here rather than the last week or two of, of the withdrawal, which was pretty much successful. When you understand that the intention of the, the Ukrainians was to take back that territory with minimum losses of their own, then perhaps that, that makes more sense of, of why they did what they did. But, says Mick Ryan, they will want to do so in a way that's, uh, where they don't sustain massive casualties. Exactly what it's talking about. The degree to which Ukraine can inflict disproportionate casualties and destruction on the Russians in the coming offences will be an important measure of success. You can imagine they're going to be using a lot of tech to do that. It's much better to send high Mars to do the jobs that your troops can do, for example, or whatever it is, right? artillery, this or that rather expend military hardware to trip the Russians than send your troops in to fight hand-to-hand, -hand, which will be very expensive for them to do. Look at Bakhmut, how much it's cost the Russians 
if you're going to do Bakhmut, you're going to lose troops, and that's not going to be successful for you, certainly in this metric. So it's going to be, I would imagine, if say if say Melitopol or Berdyansk are targets, it's going to be about you know surrounding them. That's the wrong color, really, but uh, you get the idea. It's going to be about surrounding cities, encircling them. Uh, so that the Russians pull out of, of there rather than have to fight through these cities. And at the end of the day, these cities are their own cities. They don't want to do what Russia's done to Bakhmut in their liberation. Liberation of Bakhmut and Marienka appears to be raising into the ground, uh, liberating, I don't know, order, uh, <laughs> liberating order and turning it to, yeah, to chaos. You're free, order, to go where you like. Um, it's like entropy. You're free to go where you like. We have now we're we're liberating chaos, really, and destruction. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Um, but there you go. Measure seven. Ukraine's U supporters believe the offensives have been a success, political and strategic, for Ukraine to achieve success in its operations, and the U uh, and the Ukrainian people, foreign leaders, and populations will need to think they have succeeded. So, you know, perception is just as important as reality sometimes. It will not be long until we can put these measures into action. The Ukrainian military has been preparing for its offences for some time and they are clearly ready to force the Russians out of as much of Ukraine as possible. The aim of my two articles on measuring success and failure has been to provide some sense of what victory looks like for, the, for Ukraine in the coming months. It is not an exclusive list and none of the measures are designed to be to predict specific outcomes and not all of them have to be met. But on the whole, these measures of success should provide a useful yardstick for observing and measuring success in the Ukrainian offensives to come. I think that's going to be really interesting to come back to these measures, which is one, surprise. Uh, two, destroy and degrade Russian tactical and operational reserves and command and control and logistics. Three, Ukraine takes territory. Four, Ukraine is postured to retake Crimea, so that's going to be uh, super important. Five, Ukraine captures or destroys Russian forces, so not so much the command and control logistics and all these other things, but actually just forces and hardware. Uh, six, Ukraine preserves sufficient forces themselves, so don't lose as many forces. That's going to be an objective. And then seven, public perception of success is a, is a success metric itself. So those are the seven. Let's watch out for them in the coming counteroffensive. Anyway, thank you so much. That's been me today for the extra video. Please like, subscribe and share. Really appreciate all of your uh, support. It's been fabulous. Uh, take care and I will speak to you tomorrow.